All right, gentlemen. Our next topic, the last topic for this uh, unit, is intangible assets. It's a little twisted topic. So many things are there. So make sure whatever we are doing, you understand it side by side. So let's move on. And I think we have uh, our stuff starting from slide number one thirty three. All right, intangible assets. Let me first give you an overall idea of the type of assets we are going to cover in our financial reporting. There are going to be four types of assets. One we have already done: the tangible property, plan, and equipment (PPE). The second type of assets are intangible with definite life. Intangible. The, this is, of course, tangible property, plan, and equipment are tangible assets that you can touch. And the rest of these three are intangible, the assets that you cannot touch. They do not have the physical substance. So there are three types of intangible assets that we're going to uh, finish tonight, inshallah, hopefully. First, those intangibles that have definite life, limited life, five years, 10 years. Then second type of intangibles are those intangibles that have infinite life, intangibles with infinite life. And the third type of intangible is goodwill. So we are going to see how these three different types of intangible assets are accounted for. How do we calculate their amortization? So please be with me. Things are going to be a little, uh, you know, not confusing, but since you're going to do cover these three things, so, they, so there is a risk that you might uh, run one topic over another. So make sure you see these things distinctively. Three types of intangibles, those with definite life, those with infinite life and the third type of intangible treated totally differently is the goodwill, right? So let's start. When we say an intangible, intangible means something that doesn't have the physical existence. So intangible assets are assets, of course, but they lack physical substance. They do not exist. They lack physical substance. They are identifiable. We can identify them. We'll see. They have value like licenses. They are intangible assets with quite a high value. If you have a, a license from a medicine firm, some, from some foreign-based firm, so it could be pretty expensive. Patents, you have the right to produce particular uh, item or a design. Copyrights, franchises, trademarks, all these are intangibles. You might argue that license is a physical item that we can touch. What you touch is the paper. It's not the license, it's a li license itself has a legal existence, but what you touch is the physical paper. Patent, you might have approved a patent for a medicine, for, a, for an engine design, but what you touch is just the authorization by the patent registration authority, just the text. So these, these items are represented through paper, but they do not have their own physical existence. That's why they're called intangible. So what are the kind of intangibles we're going to cover? If you acquire a license, if you purchase uh, a patent, or if you purchase a copyright, this is what you call an intangible that is externally acquired. That is externally acquired. So initially it, it is recorded at acquisition cost, the price that you have paid, and there might also be some cost that you have to pay like legal cost to acquire that asset, right? So any patent, copyright license that you acquire externally, it is an intangible, it's called externally acquired. Sometimes we might develop some, some intangible internally. Maybe we are working in a pharmaceutical firm, we come up with a unique formula to, to, for, for, to manufacture new medicine. So the amount that we spend in developing that, uh, that particular formula, you might think that might be capitalized, but please remember research and development cost under the US gap cannot be capitalized. What you can capitalize is what you're going to see right now. Please see this example clearly. Research and development cost incurred are never capitalized in the US. Now, what's the difference between these two? You just need to know, not the detail as, as we study in ACC or CA. Research is an activity or an effort to acquire some new knowledge, like COVID-19. So any effort to, uh, to, uh, to develop a formula 
to treat COVID is research. So once you conduct the research, you you identify some some formula that can help recover the patients from this disease. Then we start working on development. We develop the formula. We prepare the concentrate. We make it viable for the human beings to consume it. So these are two separate, distinct phases. Research is the first phase where you want to acquire some new knowledge, some new process, and development is the second phase where we convert that research into some viable product. Whatever you spent on research, billions of dollars, whatever you spent on development, billions of dollars under the US gap, all of it is expensed in income statement. Despite that, US firms spend billions of dollars, billions of dollars of uh, investments in research and development, despite that it will be, it will be expensed, right? All the research, all the development, no matter it took five years, it will be expensed. Then what we are going to, we are, what we are going to debit, what we are going to capitalize, only the cost for registration. Like a company invested $200,000 in research, no, no capitalization. $300,000 on development phase, both of these cannot be capitalized, right? Respectively for uh, research and development. In addition, company paid $10,000 for patent registration to the patent registration authority and $15,000 related to the legal fee for this registration. Only these two items, just these two can be capitalized. The research and development cost under the US gap is not permitted to be capitalized. Keep that in mind, gentlemen. So the patent that can be, uh, that can include the capitalizable amount is just 25,000. The research, uh, the, this amount for patent registration and the legal fee related to registration Research and development is not capitalized. So this is important point to remember. So which of the following is not considered an intangible asset? Intangible asset right here on this slide. Trademark, trademark is a tangible, is, a, uh, is an intangible asset, sorry. Just a minute, let me clean the screen first. Copyright is an intangible, patent is an intangible, the question says, which of these is not considered an intangible? The goods, the physical goods stand on its consignment. These are the items that, that are tangible. Rest of BCD are intangible items. Now, what do we do in IFRS? I told you the differences between IFRS and the US gap, they can be many, many. So you just need to focus specifically on those differences specifically given in the Glimes textbook. Do not go beyond that, otherwise, uh, accounting itself is an enormous ocean. I don't want you to waste your time for the things which have no utility for you or no advantage for you. All right, so what is the IFRS difference? As I said, under the IFRS, intangible may be accounted for either the cost model or the revaluation model. I am sure you remember, under the US gap, only the cost model is permitted. Revaluation model is not permitted under the US GAAP. IFRS allows you that you can, if you want to, you can use cost model or you may use the revaluation model. Any revaluation surplus that goes to the other company and civil income we discussed in the previous uh, lecture in detail. Then further, the revaluation model can only be applied if the intangible asset is traded in an active market. If it's a license, if it's a patent, and these licenses and patent, patents can be treated, uh, uh, are actively traded in the market. Only then we can use the revaluation model. Otherwise, it will be very difficult for us to, to establish the market price for these intangibles. So please remember, intangibles under the IFRS, they can be accounted for as per the cost model or the revaluation model. But for the revaluation model, there must be an active secondary market. So we have just learned that under the US GAAP research, as well as the development, all costs must be expensed. What IFRS has to say about it, you need to know. IFRS says that research costs, the cost incurred to acquire some understanding of some process, some, some new thing, that cost is expensed, but the cost involving development, it can be capitalized if, if certain conditions are met. There are six conditions and all of them must be met. The first condition is, that there must be some technical feasibility indicating that it is possible to complete the asset. COVID-19 vaccine that you have worked upon, it is possible to complete this product. It is technically feasible to complete. This is the first condition. Second, you should have the intention, irada. And when you say intention, means the management has the intention to complete this project and see it through. 
This is the second condition. Third, not only intention, you should have fee, falus, you should have money to complete it. All these six conditions must be met, only then the development cost can be capitalized, can be considered as an asset, right? Fourth is that uh, business or a firm should be able to demonstrate how economic benefits will come. You are able to sell your uh, medicine or this formula, and this will bring the money for you in the future. So if you can show that, that the money will come to the organization, then this is the fourth condition that is met. Yes. Uh, no, no, no. Logo trademark is different. It is intangible asset, but not, not what I'm talking about. I'm talking, do you research to develop a logo trademark? Just pay 100 real to, a, to someone who is a designer. He will just get it to you for you. I'm talking about some medicine, some designing of some engine or anything like that. That involves a lot of cost. And the fifth condition is that you should have availability of resources so that this asset can be completed. And finally, you should be able to separately measure the expenditure related to this development. So these are the five conditions that must be met. Technical feasibility, intention to complete, ability to sell. You should be able to show how the money will come by using this uh, intangible asset. You should have resources to complete. And finally, you should be able to reliably measure the expenditure related to the specific developmental project. If none of these conditions is met, then research as well as development both must be expensed. So let's try a few examples to get our understanding clearer. Which of the falling costs associated with internally developed patents should be capitalized? Remember when the question is silent, Salman, Ibrar, when the question is silent, then it's gap. When the question is silent, it means since you are doing an American certification, follow US gap. GAP says research and development, none of them can be capitalized. So the result is no. And patent registration, yes. So that means research development cost cannot be capitalized. Patent registration can be. So the option is going to be A, correct. That is the right answer. Moving on. Which of the following qualifies for asset capitalization? Remember, what we can capitalize is that relates to development. Which of the following expenditures qualified for assets capitalization? Let us see items one by one. Cost of material used in prototype testing. Prototype testing is done once we are into development stage. First, we have, we are, research is the first phase. After that is the development phase. So since the question is silent, so we should not get any ideas. We must follow the US gap. So US gap says whether research or development both must be expensed. If under the U, uh, under IFRS development cost can be capitalized, if six conditions are met, I'm going to explain just a minute. Cost of material used in prototype testing. This is development. The prototype means a working model of something. Cost of testing a prototype and modifying its design. That is development. Salaries of engineering staff developing, developing a new product that is again development. What we can capitalize under the US gap is the cost related to patent registration and any legal costs related to the patent, right? So legal costs associated with obtaining patents on a new product. This is something that you can capitalize. So that is the reason D is the right answer. Uh, salaries of engineering staff, this is development issue. So that makes D to be the correct option. Only the legal costs associated with the patent acquisition can be capitalized. Yes, under IFRS, these three development costs, these first three, ABC, can be capitalized if those six conditions are met. Okay, so that's why D is the right answer. Next question involves some computations. Please, gentlemen, attention. During the year just ended, a company incurred research and development cost of uh, $136,000 in its laboratories relating to a patent that was granted on July 1st. Since the question is silent, so this research and development cost will be expensed, not capitalized. Cost of registering the patent equal 34,000. This is the only cost that we can capitalize as per the US gap. The patent's legal life is 20 years and its estimated life is 10 years. We will discuss patents later in our lecture. Remember, if you have a patent, the law gives you protection for 20 years 
whereas the useful life is economic years you go for the lower one whichever is lower legal life or useful economic life whichever is lower since uh, legal economic life is lower so i'm going to amortize my patent for 10 years which mean my yearly amortization is going to be 3400 dollars now the question is the patent legal life is 20 estimated life is 10 we take the lower in its december 31st balance sheet what amount should the company report for the patent net of accumulated amortization now since we were given the patent authorization on 1st of july from july to december we have six months so we have to prorate it so if 3400 dollar is the amortization for whole year for six months is going to be six by 12 that is 1700 so if the cost of the patent capitalizes 34000 out of which 1700 has been amortized over the period the net amount is what you call the net book value or the carrying value and that is exactly what has been required 32300 that makes a to be the correct option next gentlemen attention for this question which of the following statements is correct about the reconciliation of the us gap and the international financial reporting standards. The cost of development must be expensed under the US gap, correct, but are capitalized under IFRS if, if there is if they meet specific criteria, which we discussed, there are six conditions to be met. If those conditions are met, only then uh, the development cost can be capitalized. So that makes uh, A to be the correct option. These are the six conditions which we have discussed in detail in our previous part of the lecture. Next. I told you, you're going to study uh, four types of different assets, property, plan, and equipment we have done. Second is intangible with definite life. This is the second categorization of asset, intangible with, with definite life. Patent is one of the examples. Patent has a definite life, a license obtained from a pharmaceutical firm for five years. Again, it's an intangible with finite or definite life, a certain life. So an intangible that has a specific lifespan whether legal life or economic life. So if the intangible has finite life, finite useful life, then what we do, we do exactly what we do with the property plan and equipment. We simply uh, allocate its depreciable base. Here it is called the amortizable amount. Remember what we previously discussed, what we previously discussed as depreciable base for property plan and equipment, it is absolutely the same under intangible. It's called amortizable amount. And this is equal to the cost less any residual value, which is the depreciable base cost minus the residual value. So remember amortizable amount or the depreciable base is the same. It is for the property plan and equipment and it is for intangible. So you do the same way you want to amortize your intangible using straight line method, your choice. You want to go for reducing balance method, your choice. Some of your digits method, whatever method you want to adopt, you can use. So just the point to remember that uh, for intangibles, just to differentiate it from our property plan and equipment, we use amortization rather than depreciation. We use the amortization expense debit and intangible asset credit. Instead of crediting intangible, you have an alternative. You can accumulate your amortization in a separate account called the accumulated amortization account. So every year this goes to income statement and this accumulated amortization, just like accumulated depreciation keeps on adding up till the asset completes its life. And this is every year we show it after uh, in the balance sheet as a deduction from the cost of the assets. So remember, as I told you that the depreciation and the amortization method is the same. Remember amortization method are similar to the depreciation method you discussed previously for property plan and equipment. Yes, correct. Depreciation is basically amortization in a way that they are used for the different types of assets. <laughs> okay. Now there is an important point here, which I think we should do later in your unit five. We haven't yet done the impairment. How do we calculate the impairment of property plan and equipment? How do we calculate the impairment of intangible assets? Please remember your property plan and equipment and your intangibles with finite or definite life. For this, we have a specific rule under the US gap It's different under the IFRS. It is different. It's a completely different topic that is covered in your unit five. 
as a as an impairment and disposal of assets so right there we will discuss how do we calculate the impairment under the us gap how do we calculate impairment of intangible under the ifrs they are the same property plan and equipment and the intangible with finite life so gap treats them in a certain way and ifrs treat them in a certain way the point to remember property plan and equipment and intangible with finite life they have same treatment for impairment so we are not going to go for impairment this is an area that we will discuss in detail in your unit 5 so let's just save time and focus exactly what we are required to do so the point here let's say if you have an intangible with the book value of uh, $70000 and during the period we calculated impairment to be 20000 right under the us gap an intangible if once impaired you cannot reverse the impairment impairment cannot be reversed this is an important point but under the ifrs if this intangible has impaired how is that impairment calculated please keep it a pending topic we will do it in our unit 5 so just for the time being remember an intangible or a property plan equipment it might lose its value because of certain reasons so impairment for finite intangible asset under the us gap this impairment can be can never be subsequently reversed but under the ifrs any impairment of intangible can be subsequently reversed so this is the major difference that you need to remember let me highlight specific areas in this so impairment loss for an asset under the us gap it may be reversed it may be reversed under the ifrs but impairment loss of an intangible or a property plan equipment under the us gap it is not reversed and under ifrs okay if it is reversed then under what circumstances under a circumstance when the change in estimate has occurred <clears throat> and now there is an evidence that the asset has more fair value than the book value then we may go for the reversal of the impairment which we previously calculated under the ifrs under the gap you cannot reverse the impairment now what is the impairment uh, process i'm going to tell you in detail in your unit 5 the greater of recoverable amount or carrying amount this is totally topic that is that is discussed in unit 5 so just for the time being keep this topic in mind and i will of course remind you when you will be doing it your property plan and equipment impairment and the impairment of intangibles with definite life they are treated in the same way they are impaired in the same way in your unit 5 so just wait for the topic to arrive uh, otherwise we can do now this is the third type of your intangible third type of your assets intangibles with indefinite useful life intangibles with indefinite useful life they have life forever now what does it mean how can an asset has an indefinite life it could be maybe that uh, the asset it's a patent for example and this patent is renewable by just paying $500 after every 10 years or let's say let's say if i have a very a famous song that i have the rights to which i have purchased right and uh, the rights are renewable after every 10 years for just by paying uh, $1000 so i have the right to the song i can play where, where wherever i want whichever media i mean um, on any media on print media wherever or the electronic media i can just renew it after 10000 10 years we're just paying $1000 which means this right is indefinite then how do we calculate impairment in 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 this case when the asset has indefinite life so let's see how it happens how it is done the qualitative and the quantitative steps so intangible with indefinite life it is not amortized amortization is done for those intangibles that have definite life 5 years 10 years like patents <laughs> but intangibles with infinite life what we do we calculate their impairment every year and how it is done let me show you in the next slide ifrs difference it's a one step quantitative impairment which we will discuss in your unit 5 please remember we do some things here some things there so when you are revising fahad things tend to join things tend to integrate so what is missing here because it is linked with unit 5 so when you are doing revision things will fall in place and now you get the, the fuller understanding of what you are doing right so keep it pending till 5 how impairment is calculated and uh, 
what are one step and two step what is one step under the ifrs and what is two step impairment under the us gap it is all something that we are going to discuss so let us calculate the impairment for indefinite intangible with indefinite useful life for this we have two step model first is the quantitative assessment this is the impairment test it's a two step model in the us gap intangible with indefinite useful life we assess its value at least annually if there is any impairment so there are two steps first is the <coughs> qualitative assessment qualitative assessment is just uh, it doesn't involve any computation it is just an assessment by the management just an assessment by the management that the asset may have undergone some change over the period so if you have uh, $100000 related to this asset in your books so you think that this 100000 doesn't appear to be just it is overstated the circumstances tell us that it is overstated let's say you have a right to a classical song by jagjit singh for example and you bought this for $100000 now since people are now moving to more modern form of music so you think that this amount that i'm showing on my balance sheet as an intangible asset it is overstated no one likes classical music i'm sure very few amongst you would like classical music unless you are more than 60 years old so this appears to be overstated so i think i need to bring this down so the first step is called the qualitative assessment it doesn't involve any any computation just an assessment that yeah this amount is overstated it needs to be brought into the right perspective or to the right amount so the first phase the first step is the qualitative step let me mark some important points from here and then we'll move on so under the qualitative assessment we basically do no computation it is just an assessment that it is more likely it's more than 50% that people will not be interested in this song in the future so if it is so if you think that this has happened there is more than 50% probability that the asset is no longer that much desirable so then it's that means that there is a potential impairment then we go for the next step called the quantitative assessment let me show you through this table first we conducted this qualitative assessment well <laughs> salman said my voice when i sing is horrible well is horrible so that's why i i experiment singing when i'm taking back okay so the first qualitative assessment will indicate that there is a there is a indication that the asset is impaired no numbers no computation here but the second step will show you what is the impairment like uh, we have this song in our books for $100000 but let's say if i just take the song to salman who loves jagjit and i ask him i want to sell the rights to the song salman says sir i will pay only 80000 and this is somewhat the price subhan is willing to pay i do i wallah lazim subhan is willing to pay somewhat similar amount so this means that the fair value is just 80000 and we are we are carrying the song for 100000 in our books which means gentlemen which means the song unfortunately the master of ghazal gaiki he has lost 20000 and this means that we have to write this 20000 off under the us gap once this loss has been recorded you cannot reverse loss is irreversible under the us gap but it may be reversed subsequently if people start uh, getting interest in classical songs so impairment loss is non reversible under the us gap so we will take the new basis of 80000 now the new basis will be 80000 20000 is gone and it is irreversible under the us gap right so let's try a few questions to see how well we have understood a recognizable intangible asset is amortized over its useful life unless the pattern of okay go through these all options and see which of these do you think is the correct option and recognizable intangible asset it doesn't say so whether it is uh, the asset with definite life or an indefinite life <coughs> go ahead amortization we know it is for those assets that have definite life yes amortization is only done for those assets that have indefinite life impairment is calculated for those assets that have indefinite life for amortization is definite so it's going to be b so if the asset is determined to be finite rest of these are no no uh, criteria or conditions we just need to see an asset is amortizable if it has definite life and nothing else to be seen b is the right answer now 
which of the following asset if any acquired this year is an exchange of transaction is potentially amortizable goodwill is not amortized goodwill is treated as a totally different intangible asset trademarks since they have specific life so they are amortizable so it's going to be no yes so when you say no yes it's going to be b right and then we have the third type of in fact the last type of our intangibles goodwill 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 let's briefly discuss what is goodwill let's say let's take this example this will explain the idea of goodwill goodwill only arises on business combination this is very important point goodwill is recognized only in a business combination when a business a purchases a business b then the amount of goodwill may arise let's let's see this example an entity c acquired 80% of the outstanding common stock of entity d for 192000 One company purchased eighty percent shares of another company by paying one ninety two thousand dollar. Entity D's acquisition date, fair value of identifiable assets and liabilities were three fifty and one forty. When we acquired this business, at that point three fifty was the fair value of the assets, fair value, not the book value, and one forty was the fair value of the liabilities. The acquisition date, non-controlling interest, since I acquired eighty percent, right, and the remaining twenty percent which I could not acquire. the fair value of that non controlling interest was 48 please gentlemen focus this is something you won't be tested on because goodwill uh, computation and consolidation is discussed in advanced accounting like accca for your level you just need to know how goodwill is amortized or maximum how it is calculated beyond that consolidation combining income statement and uh, cash flows and balance sheet this is way beyond your uh, scope of your course so how do we calculate goodwill I paid one ninety two thousand dollar to acquire a business that had assets of three fifty and liabilities of one forty, which means if you calculate the net value of uh, net book value or net value of these uh, assets and liabilities three fifty less one forty, it will give me two ten. Now, gentlemen, listen to me very carefully. How do we calculate goodwill? <coughs> I am going to acquire a business eighty percent of this business by paying one ninety two, and this business has a total fair value. After adjusting liabilities is two ten three fifty less one forty. Okay, now what I'm paying is one ninety two thousand dollar. This is what I'm paying as a consideration, eighty percent. And what remaining twenty percent holds is forty eight. So in other words, this is what I'm paying together with the non controlling interest. And what I'm getting in return is two ten. So what I'm paying basically is one ninety two plus forty eight. That is the non controlling interest. That is two forty. So out of this two forty, one ninety two is mine. And forty-eight belongs to the non-controlling interest, but the okat or the value of this business at the rate of acquisition was just two ten. If you just see what you are paying plus the non-controlling interest is two forty, whereas the net value of the uh, assets and liabilities, what you call the uh, fair value of net assets, fair value of assets less fair value of liabilities, is just two ten. The extra amount is called goodwill, right? Now let's say remove the uh, non-controlling interest. and take a totally different example let's say i acquire a uh, 100% shares in a company and listed in the us ahrar incorporated for example and uh, for this company i pay let's say $500000 right now ahrar's net assets fair value of assets less and liability deducted is only worth $350000 now a business that has a value of 350 only fair value of assets Minus fair value of liabilities, three fifty. I'm paying five hundred thousand dollars for this. This one fifty thousand I'm paying more is because of the good name Aharad might have earned over the years running his business. So this one fifty thousand is the goodwill, right? It is possible. It is possible that I may pay five hundred thousand dollar for a business that has a, a value of eight fifty. Under very very un uh, rare circumstances, maybe just Aharad wants to go to Mars. and he just want to sell his firm at a throwaway price so a firm that should be sold at 850 rr sold it to me for $500000 very unlikely but if it happens let's say if it happens then the difference 350 dollar it is called the gain on bargain purchase it is gain this is considered gain in the consolidated financial statement just keep that up to this point no need to take it any further you just need to focus on the goodwill mostly we pay more than what we get and the extra amount we pay is called the goodwill right just like in this case 
we paid a total of 240 whereas the the fair value of net assets was 210 the difference was 30 this is called goodwill and this goodwill will show up in the books of c because c acquired 80 percent shares uh, in d i'm sure you would remember if your holding is more than 50 percent and less than 100 percent or up to 100 percent then you have to consolidate you will add your financial statements with d your income statement would be added to d's income statement your balance sheet will be added your cash flow statements will be added and this yes 80 percent is is what you call the controlling stake controlling interest and the remaining 20 percent is called the non-controlling interest non-controlling interest like 80 percent is the is the quite a sizable stake 80 percent means you control you have the controlling interest and the remaining 20 percent poor people they do not have control they are called non-controlling interest means the percentage is so small that they cannot control interest in the business that is non that's not in a way to control right <coughs> so c is considered as a parent and d is the subsidiary minority interest this is the old name yes boss you're right minority interest is an old terminology but uh, we now use this non-controlling interest for minority interest so then what do we do with goodwill now Goodwill is not amortized. I told you there are four types of assets out of which we have discussed three property, plan, and equipment, intangibles with definite life, intangibles with indefinite life, and goodwill is treated separately. This is the fourth type of assets. So, what we do with the goodwill? Goodwill is impaired. Goodwill is tested for impairment at the reporting unit level. Now, what does it mean? Let's say if I'm the parent. I have a subsidiary A, I have a subsidiary B, I have a subsidiary C. And when I acquired 80% shares of A, 70% shares of B, and maybe 69% shares of C, on every acquisition, there would have been some goodwill. On A, maybe the goodwill is $40,000. For B, the goodwill is maybe $30,000. And similarly for C also. So goodwill is tested for impairment at reporting unit level. So it means I will, if I need to test the impairment for goodwill, I will go to the level of A, which is my reporting entity, my subsidiary. Same for B, same for C, right? So we will test the impairment of goodwill at a reporting unit level. Now, let me take directly to you to the steps that are involved in calculation of impairment rather than the verbosity. I don't like verbosity in accounting, unfortunately. When I was your age doing uh, the basic accounting, I would rush towards the questions rather than reading the theory. So what I used to do, I used to do the questions first and then I went back to the theory and that did make much more sense. Theory and accounting won't make much sense unless you know how to do it practically. So this was my way of doing things. Questions and then back to theory. So it worked for me, always worked for me. So I don't know what is your preferred way of doing. So let us go see how impairment is calculated. Let's focus on this particular table. Gentlemen, please be with me. And I will show you how the impairment is calculated at each reporting unit level. You may have an entity A, B or C or D as your subsidiary. How do we calculate impairment? Please be with me. Let's say take an example. Uh, I have a subsidiary S, for example, right? How do we calculate the loss on impairment or the impairment loss for goodwill at each entity level? Now, let us assume, take some numbers and then apply the concept and all these steps one by one. Carrying amount of reporting unit, I have this subsidiary in my books it has a value of uh, let's say uh, take any number let's say take it 120000 120000 is the carrying amount of reporting unit the the entity i bought i paid 120000 for it right now its fair value is just 90000 dollar fair value is just 90000 dollar Whereas I'm carrying this subsidiary at 120. This is the first step that tells me that by impairment only. This, this indicates that there is an impairment because your carrying amount is more, right? And before that, of course, there's a qualitative test, uh, just like the previous way. Qualitative test means you just assess without any number. You just assess whether there's a potential impairment. It appears that the company is no longer that much valuable. So there appears to be an impairment. It basically, it involves no computation. It's just an assessment just an andaza, just an estimate involving no numbers. Actual test starts from here. When you believe that there is something that needs to be uh, taken care of for impairment, then you go for the second step uh, for quantitative step. So this, the first step is 
you what you compare the carrying amount of your reporting unit when you purchase a harar incorporated or s incorporated you paid 120 that's the carrying amount of reporting unit right right now its fair value is just 90 which means carrying amount is much more than the fair value it indicates that there is some impairment we should pursue this next we calculate the implied fair value of the reporting unit goodwill how do we calculate the implied fair value of reporting unit goodwill this is the formula given please gentlemen see i'm going to plug in the numbers implied fair value of reporting unit goodwill not the actual goodwill because actual goodwill when i recorded when i acquired this company i paid 120 the goodwill at that point may have been let's say take any number for goodwill uh take my goodwill to be 25000 when when it was acquired 25000 is appearing on my books so this is the goodwill appearing on my books at reporting unit level okay so the carrying amount of reporting unit is 120 but its fair value is just 90 next step is to calculate the implied fair value of reporting unit how do we calculate it fair value of reporting unit is just 90 now the fair value is just 90 now if you take the assets and liabilities just 90 now fair value of the reporting unit net assets so if you sell the assets piece by piece one asset at a time it will get you only 80000 gentlemen this is what you call goodwill right now the goodwill is only 10000 because the business as a whole the business as a whole will get you 90000 dollar business as a whole this subsidiary as if you sell it right now it will bring you 90000 as a whole this is the fair value right now if you sell its assets bit by bit shoya 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 one by one it gets you in pieces 80 so the difference between the whole business sold and the pieces sold this is what you call goodwill gentlemen that's what you call goodwill the difference between the business as a whole and the asset sold bit by bit that's what you call goodwill so it means right now the implied goodwill is just $10000 business as a whole 90 pieces 80 the difference between whole business and pieces is 10 what i'm carrying in my books is 25 implied fair value as per this calculation is 10 which means my goodwill is impaired by 15000 this is the impairment loss which i have to book in my accounts and it is a reversible please i have repeated it a couple of times after the class please watch this specific section of impairment of goodwill it's pretty straight forward if you focus on exactly these numbers and do the working yourself remember under the us gap write down is irreversible so goodwill should be tested for impairment at which of the following levels at each reporting unit level i may have a subsidiary a i may have a subsidiary rr or b or c or d so goodwill is tested for impairment at each reporting unit level against which the goodwill arose when you acquired that so that makes b to be the correct option a company should recognize goodwill in its balance sheet at which of the following points internally generated goodwill cannot be considered let's say if a business has a very good name like apple incorporated it has quite a good following internationally so it cannot incorporate its own goodwill in its income or in its balance sheet no goodwill only arises in business combination right <coughs> a company cannot consider its good name in its own financial statement as an asset so which of the following uh, it says that goodwill is recognized at what point in time cost have been incurred in the development of goodwill no internally generated goodwill is not allowed to be capitalized the company expects a future benefit from the creation of goodwill good you don't create goodwill no goodwill has been created in a purchase of a business when you purchase a business like i purchase <coughs> rr business that has a Uh, fair value of net assets 350 i paid 500000 for this business so this indicate that the goodwill created was 150 so this is the idea business as a whole i had to pay one uh, 500000 but in pieces it's 350 the different between business as a whole and in pieces this gap is what you call the goodwill right this is the idea behind goodwill if i sell individual assets of of a uh, rs business one by one net amount i receive is 350 but business as a whole is worth $500,000 this difference is because of goodwill okay now the last topic patents let's say i develop some revolutionary uh engine design or some revolutionary uh medicine or vaccine for covid every variant of covid is treatable let's say that if that is the formula so i can get my my formula my my design of 
this medicine, I can get it protected under the court of law, under the US law, that is the Patent Registration Authority. So let's say <coughs> when I go to the Patent Registration Authority, they give me a legal life of 20 years. But when I discuss with my, uh, with my researchers and my marketing staff, they tell me that it is possible that many such competing firms like Pfizer, like GlaxoSmithKline, they might, they might bring something like this in the next 10 years. So they, they put a, a useful life of 10 years. So the patent is to be amortized on shorter of useful life or remaining legal life, whichever is, whichever is sh uh, shorter. Now, what can you capitalize for patent? Only the patent registration fee, no research and development cost be capitalized. Please remember, no research and development cost can be capitalized. Only the amount you paid for the registration of patent plus any legal fees associated with it. Nothing else. Question. You classify patent in definite, indefinite and infinite integration. No, no, no. Patent, see, patent, if it has if it has 10 years or 20 years life, after that it's going to go away. Then it has definite life. But if a patent is renewable by just paying $500 and it appears that no one will be able to bring something in market similar to you, then in that case, it is indefinite. You just have to see from the, from the context, from the question that the asset we are considering, patent is intangible. A license even is intangible, right? If license is renewable just by paying $1,000 every five years, this means a very small amount and this asset can last for as long as the world is there. So you just have to see, Subhana, how do we distinguish between these? So remember, useful life given by your marketing team or your researchers or the legal life, whichever is lower, you need to take that and you need to amortize the amount of your intangible over that period. Yes. Not the word itself, infinite or definite, but the question will tell you. The question will tell you, the, 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 uh, the context will explain whether the asset is for limitless life or it has a certain life yes scenario exactly now it is possible that let's say if i have a, i have developed a, a unique medicine for covid then maybe someone existing like pfizer like GlaxoSmithKline, they might uh, file a suit against me in the court of law that asif has brought a, uh, an item that is quite similar to them so for that i may have to pay a lot of money for uh, defending my legal suit, or for defending my title. Now, here is a very important point to learn. Legal defense, if there is a case against me that Asif has created or registered a patent and is preparing a medicine which is so similar to JSK or Pfizer or XYZ company, then there can be two situations. Either I lose or either I win. Now, listen to me very carefully. If I had to pay fifteen thousand dollar for the defense of my, my for the defense of my patent, and if I win, if the litigation is successful, if the litigation is successful, then this fifteen thousand dollar, which technically is an expense, it can be it can be added to the cost of the patent. It is made an asset. The cost of successfully defending a lawsuit can be made an asset. And in case if I lose. Because I win because the, uh, the, 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 see, there are two, two parties to a case. One is the defendant who is defending his title. And other is the one who has filed a case, plaintiff. So let's say the plaintiff who has filed a case against me, let's say in this case, uh, Pfizer. Pfizer has filed a case again in the court of law. So Pfizer plaintiff, I'm the defendant. If Pfizer fails to prove in the court of law that Asif is cheated, then I win. And I paid $15,000 for my lawyer fees and legal fees. So if in case, if I win this case against Pfizer, Pfizer, Pfizer loses, this $15,000 is made an asset and is considered as a part of patent cost. But if I lose, if the success, I mean, if, if, the, if Pfizer wins and I lose, not only I will have to charge this as an expense, as a legal expense, but I must also consider that this patent I'm holding is worthless. I may have to write down the remaining cost, uh, remaining value, and put it off in the in the income statement. I'm going to repeat it again. I hold a patent. If Pfizer, who is plaintiff, who files a case against me in the court of law, 
if they file a case against me and if i win any cost that i pay for defending the title this cost becomes an asset and it is added to the cost of the patent right that means my patent is strong but if i lose it will have very bad consequences because not only this fifteen thousand dollar is expensed in income statement but i may have to write down my patent altogether mafi faida patent is worthless faida is able to successfully convince the court that i have copied so which means my patent has no value at all so i may have to write it down right so this is the important point to be noted let us test this our understanding from the questions a corporation purchases a patent at the beginning of the year for 22100 that's the price we paid <coughs> and it was to be amortized over a period of 17 years see subhan the question will tell you whether the the patent or the license or the copyright is 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 definite or indefinite in this case it is clearly an amortizable patent all righty what happens if 22100 is the cost of the patent which includes of course registration and legal fee mafi research and development please remember the research and development cost under the ifr under the us gap it is not capitalizable so if it is amortized there is no residual value which means every year we will have to amortize 1300 dollars now what happens on july 1st of year 8 the corporation incurred legal cost of 11400 to successfully defend the patent since the cost was success the you were successful in defending the case against you which means this 11400 must be capitalized as a part of the patent cost the amount of amortization expense that the corporation should record for year 8 now what you should note here the patent was granted on year 1 and it was uh, the, you won the case on 1st july year 8 which means if you calculate the time period july 1st year 8 so year 1 full year 2 full 3 4 5 6 7 7 in the middle of year 8 which means you are talking about 7.5 5 6 7 7.5 years are gone remaining life of the uh, patent is now 17 minus 7.5 the remaining life life is now 9.5 the remaining life is now 9.5 out of 17 7.5 are gone the remaining life is 9.5 remember for the patent cost we charge 1300 dollar every year so for the year 8 from 1st of jan to 31st of december the full amount that goes to amortization is 22100 upon 17 1300 but this 11400 which we are going to make an asset in our books it will have a life of 9.5 years since it happened on 1st of july so first you will get the annual you will calculate the annual amortization 11400 upon 9.5 11400 is the cost of successful defense divided by 9.5 gives you annual amortization of 1200 since you you won the case on 1st of july which means you can only charge 6 months amount of amortization from july august september october november december 6 months only 6 by 12 so that's going to give you 600 dollar now gentlemen listen 1300 dollar for the original cost of the uh, patent it is a part of amortization expense and half yearly for for the successful defense of the legal case against you that's going to be 600 so the total amount of amortization 1300 plus 600 charge to income statement is going to be 1900 so this is the point to be noted 600 for the successful defense amount capitalized and 1300 for the regular patent so the total amount goes is 1900 that makes c to be the correct option and c it is next a company acquired a patent on uh, its new manufacturing process which streamlines its production operation the cost of the patent was 17000 and the company expects that the useful life of the new process will be 10 years okay although the legal life of the patent is 17 we have discussed legal life or the useful life whichever is lower so we are going to take the lower which is 10 and we are going to take the cost of the patent and what it says further the company's calendar year jan to december and it's preparing its december 31st uh, uh, financial statements at what amount should the patent be reported on december 31st year of acquisition remember we acquired this patent on july 1st the annual amortization is 
since we acquired on July, so we're going to charge six by 12. That means it's 850. So the first year amortization is 850. The question says, at what amount should the patent be reported on the balance sheet? So you're talking about the net book value or the carrying value, net book value or the carrying values, which is equal to original historical cost less the accumulated amortization, which is 850. Absolutely, Fahad, you got it right. It is 16. 150. So that makes C to be the correct option. Next, this is an easy question for you. A purchase patent has a remaining legal life of 15 years. It should be expensed in the year of acquisition. No, it's a purchase patent. Whatever you have paid, this is what you will amortize. It's a purchase one. This is important. This is important, Harar. If you acquired a patent, you may have paid $5 million for this patent. So this is the amount you will amortize, right? Not what he what not what not he paid as a patent registration fee. No, what you have paid, this is your cost. Irrespective, you might have paid $25,000 for registration. Since you have paid $5 million for this patent, this is your cost. And this is what you're going to amortize. So expense in the year of acquisition, no, it is not research and development. Amortize over 15 years, regardless of useful life, wrong. Amortize over its useful life if it is less than 15 years. Absolutely. If the useful life is less than 15 years, that is going to be your base. Talha, you're absolutely right. Salman, you're right. So this is C. Next. Under IFRS, an entity that acquires an intangible asset may use the revaluation model for the subsequent measurement only. I think this relates to the very first topic. You can use the revaluation model only for an intangible if it has an active active market from the very first uh, uh, few slides that we did an active market exists only then we can use the revaluation model otherwise these are not the criterias not a the useful life of the intangible is reliably determined the cost of intangible or the intangible asset is monetary asset it is non-monetary by the way so this is the only condition that we had there it should have an active secondary market in which it could be sold so that makes b to be the correct option next Legal fee incurred by a company in defending its patent rights should be capitalized when the outcome of litigation is. It can only be capitalized when the outcome of the litigation is successful. If it is unsuccessful, then you may have to write down it as an expense, right? So in this case, it's going to be yes, no, right? Remember, absolutely, Talha, got it right, Subhan. All of you are right. So if you, if you succeed in defending the title, then in that case, the legal cost is capitalized. And if you lose, not only your legal cost is expense, your patent is worth nothing. The last question, which is a very dangerous one, please, gentlemen, last but not the least. So I'm going to borrow a few minutes from our part two guys. And I hope a few of them are here. Najaf is here. Najaf, please, if you allow me, I can just complete this beautiful, lovely question here. Gray Company was granted a patent on January 2, year 5. And appropriately capitalize 45,000 of related cost. So this is the amount capitalized, $45,000. Gray was amortizing. Remember, you acquired this on January 2, year 5. Gray was amortizing the patent over its estimated useful life of 15 years, which means annual amortization was, thank you, Najaf. 45,000 divided by 15, which means every year amortization is $3,000, right? 45,115. Now, what happened, gentlemen? During year eight, Gray paid 15,000 in the legal cost in successfully defending an attempted infringement of the patent. Beautiful words, infringement. Gary, uh, Gray paid 15,000 in legal cost in successfully defending an attempted infringement to the patent. Somebody filed a case against me regarding the patent infringement that I cheated. In fact, they were mine and I was, the, I was the legitimate owner and the patents were not stolen, basically. I won the case and I paid $15,000 for legal fees. Since I am successful, this $15,000 will be added to the cost of the patent. After the legal action was completed, Gray sold the patent to the plaintiff for $75,000. So after I succeeded, I just sold this patent to the plaintiff for $75,000. What I have to do, Gray's policy is to... Is to to take no amortization in the year of disposal, <laughs> when you sell, there is no amortization, then 
in year rate income statement, what amount should Gray report as a gain from sale? A beautiful question indeed. Will help you understand different concepts simultaneously. First of all, the annual amortization is 3000. You use the, uh, uh, the intangible for year two full, year three full, year four full. And in year five, rather I would write it as year five basically. So you use it for years five full, year five full, year six, year seven. And during year eight, you sold it. And it says that there is no amortization in the year of disposal. So no amortization for year eight. So you're going to charge as three as amortization, which means the total amortization charge is 9,000. So if this is so, the original cost of the uh, of the intangible was 45. Out of this, 9,000 has been amortized. Now the book value of the patent, 45 less nine is $36,000. This is the book value, okay? This is the book value when there was a case. I won the case and this $15,000, the legal cost of successfully defending the case against you. Now the, the book value of my patent is 36 plus the successful defense of my patent now the book value is $51,000, right? Now, if the plaintiff is interested and I am willing to sell, I sold this for $75,000. $51,000 is my book value. Seventy-five dollars is the disposal value. The difference between what the book value is and what I dispose it for, the difference is $24,000. And this is the gain on disposal, which I'm going to record in my income statement. So that makes B to be the correct option, gentlemen, and that ends your unit three completely. Uh, tomorrow we will be starting with unit four and it will involve uh, different types of expenses, uh, warranties, uh, contingent liabilities, all inshallah will be discussed tomorrow. So thank you for attending the class. I'll see you guys tomorrow inshallah.